So, uh, right, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you ever so much for joining us. Uh, we are here to, this, tonight to go through safeguarding people in cricket. Uh, we've got myself here, the club and league development officer. You, a lot of you uh, get communications from me, but have seen my face an awful lot in these webinars over the past six weeks. Uh, they've been really enjoyable and hopefully you've got a lot out of them. Uh, with us tonight, we've got Richard Watson from the ECB safeguarding team uh, and Brian Hoyle, one of my colleagues at Somerset Cricket Board, uh, who deals with a lot of safeguarding as part of his role at the cricket board. As you can see, we've got the agenda here. Uh, we're going through some club responsibilities, policies and procedures, the role of a safeguarding officer at your club, uh, clubs and skills matrix, uh, help and some help and support. We've got a dedicated question section at the end where we might pick up questions which haven't been answered through the evening. Uh, but any time, as I said, please put qu questions in the uh, in the chat box because it may be relevant at that point to pick it up and other people may be thinking it. Uh, but without further ado, we are going to get you to think about safeguarding at your club first. So what we are going, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put you all into a breakout room. It will have four or five people in each group, and what we want you're going to have eight minutes, and in that eight minutes, we would like you to discuss what measures are in place uh, that make your club safe. So anything, lots of ideas, have a chat, introduce yourself, find out what, what you think is in place at your club uh, or at other clubs to make them safe. And then what will happen when you come back out of the breakout rooms, you will have an opportunity to write up your answers all on a nice whiteboard using the annotate function, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, I'm just going to put you all into the breakout rooms. No in slowly uh, so hopefully you've had lots of good discussion in your group around uh, what measures you've got in place uh, to make cricket safe uh, so two options here hopefully you'll have access to the annotate tool uh, it'll either be at the top or the bottom toolbar and you can start typing all the things that you came up with in your group and plop it on our screen if you struggle with the annotate, you can also write in the chat box and we'll pick out some of the things uh, which you've discussed and things that we're in place and then we will discuss them. So got two minutes off you go, start uh, writing up. So safeguarding officer, policies. Oh, I like that, Martin. Good drawing skills, not even typing. Uh, that's brilliant. Uh, you can use the text function, function. Uh, risk assessments. DBS. I like this. People are drawing. We've never, we haven't had drawing before. This is good. Um, culture of safeguarding the club in the chat box. A culture across the club where safeguarding. Everyone knows their responsibility. Great stuff. Uh, support from the SCB. Codes of conduct. First aid. The Safe Hands Portal. Club committee sponsor, nowhere to go if there's a problem. Brilliant. Uh, loads of great stuff. Identify CWO, full contact. Achieving buy-in of those who need DBS certificates. Coaching ratios, on-field behaviour. Oh, some great ones. We'll give it 30, 30 more seconds. Uh, some great, great ones coming up. Uh, concussion protocols. I'm just trying to move around. Uh, probably the most important things that club we must do as a club. Uh, we'll come on to that a bit in a minute. Uh, safeguarding policies, documentations. Yeah, mental health. Uh, Buy-in from more than one or two members, so everyone takes responsibility. Being able to communicate problems with people. Uh, first aid has popped up. Right, brilliant. That's excellent. Uh, thanks ever so much for all taking part in that. I'm just going to save that so I can look at that again and then I'll clear all the drawings. Right. Thank you for participating in that. And ju it's just trying to get you thinking about what you already do at your clubs uh, and what you've seen done at other clubs. 
I'm now going to pass you over to Richard Watson. He's a member of the ECB Safeguarding, and he's going to take you through uh, the main section of this. Uh, so I'll let Rich introduce himself. And as I said, if there's any questions, please pop them in the chat box. Uh, but you're probably going to be with Rich now for the probably next 10, 15 minutes. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, just a, a thank you, really, from me. Um, we do know that if you're anything like myself, there's not much else to do at the moment because we're all locked up at home. But we really do appreciate that you've set some time aside today to, to kind of think about safeguarding, to even if it's just a refresher for yourselves and, and really start to, you know, think about the return to cricket for me. And it's about creating those safe environments for our young people that have gone through so much over the last year. Um, some of the slides I am going to go through are, if you've done the Safe Hands webinar in probably the last year, it might be some duplication of the slides. But what Matt wanted me to do is provide some consistency. So some of those messages are shared. So I did see someone put in the chat that they had the pleasure of myself for two and a half hours last night. So some of this might be a bit of duplication from those slides, but it's really about building that consistency across the network. So uh, I'm a county safeguarding advisor. So my role day in, day out is to support the counties in how they deliver safeguarding and therefore how they deliver safeguarding and support you as clubs to be able to deliver to those young people that are playing our game. This slide talks around um, just giving that bit of a legal framework to what is it that we do in safeguarding. So a lot of people talk to us about what's the club's responsibility, whose responsibility is, where does it come from? I just want to give that ethos that it isn't just ourselves at the ECB that sit there and go, look, we'll make them do this and we'll make them do that and we go from there. We as um, a national governing body of sport, we're independently uh, regulated by an organisation called the Child Protection Sport Unit. So they come in, they sit with us and they talk about how we deliver safeguarding across the game. They do it with all national governing bodies of sport. So they hold us accountable. So it isn't just us sitting there going, we'll do this and we'll do that. So we have some legislation we work around, Protection and Freedom Act. That's where we change CRB to DBS. And yes, you know, I look back now and think that's nine years ago and think, where's time flown by? Um, we've got working together to safeguard children. We all know that we all have different contact with young people. School have contact, health, education, and working together brings organisations, like it says, together to share information about young people. With our duty to report, it's those messages that within your club, whether you're a coach, whether you're a chair, that ethos to say, do you know what? We, we need, if you've got a concern, talk to us, share that concern. And then once you've got that concern, it's your then duty to share that concern for that young person, whether that's an escalation process, whether that's to your safeguarding officer, whether that's doing something about it as a safeguarding officer, or even then escalating it to the county or ourselves as the ECB safeguarding team. We've got some regulations around positions of trust responsibility. It, the easiest way to think about that is that we within cricket as adults, we make decisions for young people. The decisions we make affect them every single day we're going to play on this pitch we're going to do this we're going to do that and unfortunately there are incidents where individuals might look to abuse that position of power and trust and then within the game we see that as a real you know people shouldn't do that and we, you know and we stop and prevent that can I go on to my next slide? I feel like I'm at the government now. Next slide, please, sir. Um, this has got a lot more text on. So um, what I'll do is I won't talk through it straight away. I'll just give you a minute to have a look, have a read, uh, and then I'll try and re reiterate a few of the points. So I'll just give you a minute to read it, and then I will reiterate a few of the points. Okay, so this is this is kind of built around organisation. So the three layers, the committee, the chair, the, the, the power influence within the club, the safeguarding officer and those paid coaches and volunteers. We use the phrase all the time that safeguarding is everyone's responsibility. It is and it's creating a culture as a committee, as a chair, as individuals to ensure that your club is safe. And in that, it's supporting your club safeguarding officer. It's all coming together and going, we can't just let one person do this. Actually, it's about creating that culture and ethos. You as a club will have your own ethos, what you stand for, what you do, how you create that environment. And all those things on the first slide is about creating that environment. 
So actually, it's about thinking, thinking, thinking it through and going, how can I support the people that are around me? And then it talks about as coaches and as volunteers, it, it, it's that moral responsibility to ensure that participants are safeguarded and protected within their club. Next slide, please. So one of the things that uh, Matt had asked me to cover was around club responsibility. So if, I, if you're sitting there as a chair, you're sitting there as a coach or you're sitting there as a committee member, what is it that we, we should be doing from a club point of view? And this is kind of quick, quick four points to think about. It's about having robust safeguarding provision in place. So have we got the policies and procedures in place to make it as safe as we can before we even start? So do we share those policies? Do we make sure that we get codes of conduct signed? Because codes of conduct then create that expectations within your club. You've got expecta expectations for your volunteers, you've got expectations for your parents and members and young people. Actually, we, we involve young people in all of this because we know that there will be a percentage of incidents that occur where young people, it might be bullying, it might be something is said about them over social media. But we don't get away from the fact that young people will always fall out with young people and adults will always fall out with adults. Something will be said, something will be done. <coughs> There'll be, you know, someone might say um, that it's legend, but incidents will occur. So actually it's about having expectations of what you as a club expect from your volunteers and, and how to act in those situations. And then it sets out, actually, if this happens, we've got a problem, then we can deal with it in the appropriate way. And that links there to that dealing with complaints and concerns. So if someone has a concern and shares a complaint, then there should be an appropriate process that you go through to ensure that those complaints are dealt with. We use the word timely because we know your volunteers and we know that time, you know, parents will say to us, oh, it wasn't done quick enough or X, Y and Z. It's about managing expectations for me. It's about putting the child at the centre of what we do. So if we've got a complaint that a child's getting bullied or an incident occurs, speaking to the child and going, what do you want to happen with this? It's not jumping in two feet like we do as adults at times and, and try and change the world. It's actually engaging and listening to young people and going, this is what we want. And that links to that review to the safe delivery of cricket. Actually, it's about reviewing everything we do. I like to think of it as that coach at the end of a session. You're, you're delivered your session. You've got your perfect plan. It never goes to perfect plan because you're working with kids. So it, it, something's going to happen. So, you know, something will change. Someone will need to go to the toilet at some point and that wasn't planned in. It's about reviewing. Well, actually, we've delivered the best we can. Fantastic. We move forward. But you will reflect and go, how can we make that better? What are we doing to ensure that we keep keep the things that we need to do and deliver it in the right and appropriate and safe way? What we've done is we've created a bit of a, a checklist for you as clubs. So what is it that I, you know, that I've got to have in place? Tell me the things because we do know that at times there's messages that come out and you go, we've got to have this. Have we got to have that? Have we got to have this? So for us, it's working to this checklist, having these things in place. I won't go over everything because I'm sure that a lot of a lot of you have already seen these things before have engaged with them. We always say go to our website because that's where the most up to date policies are. We are updating them all the time. Myself, who sits within the proactive safeguarding team, we look at how we can make things better for you as clubs. All I would all I would pick out from that list is two things for me. So well, the first one is around safeguarding information for young people and listening to children. When we go into cricket clubs, I know it's an amazing thing to think we can walk into a room and it's cricket and it's great. But when we get back into our cricket clubs, actually, what information is there for young people? How do we engage them? Because they're probably not going to read a safeguarding children policy. They're not going to read your health and safety policy. So if there's something on there that can engage them and how we listen to them, that's that for me is the, the most important thing. Um, we use examples on the on the on the webinars around listening to children. And actually, you know, I had a club who's got a whiteboard and they put a question of the week on and everyone writes on it and the kids just come in and write on it. I think absolutely fantastic. But you know your you know your club, you know how big you are, how small you are. But it's about listening to them because that's what we want to do. We want to make sure we deliver cricket for what they want and therefore we make it as fun and as engaging as possible. Thanks, Matt. What we you know, one of the things that uh, Matt had also asked me to deliver is around that role of the club safeguarding officer. So there's club safeguarding officers. You will know this. This is what you do. But for those that aren't on the call, what is the role of the safeguarding officer? For me, 
it's about being that approachable person in the club that person that is within within the club supported by their committee supported by their coaches and engaging in conversations with young people with coaches with volunteers and with parents and that approachable individual that can do that it's about creating that self and safe and welcoming environment all those things that you put on the slide straight is is how we do it how we meet how we create how we ensure our ethos is there it's the same, you know, we talk about it being the club safeguard and officer's responsibility, but actually it's the club's responsibility. It's linked. So actually it's the club safeguard officer coming to you as a committee or coaches and going, this is, we're, we're going to, we want to do it this way because of X, Y, and Z, because the young kids want us to do it that way. So that's how we'll do it. Promoting uh, policies and procedures. I've, I've picked that off um, just on the, on the other slide. Um, making safeguarding a key factor in, in when we think about junior considerations. Um, it, it is about thinking, are we doing, are we giving them what they want? Are we making it fun? Are we making it engaging? Are we actually involving all those young people? I I like to, on there it talks about vetting and DBS and we get into lots of conversations around DBS. So I'll just say this line, a DBS is still only a piece of paper about someone. It's the best piece of paper you can get, but it's still only a piece of paper. So actually it's the process, the way we support our coaches and our volunteers that's the most important part. Because actually if we're supporting them, either in induction, in training, making sure they're up to date with their qualifications, that factor and getting references at the start, recruiting them appropriately, is going to give you a lot more information than just the piece of paper from us that says, yeah, I've got a DBS. Because I'm sure that we've all seen coaches, we've all seen individuals, we've been sporting settings and we go, uh, you know, the, the DBS is fine, but actually the way they work won't fit into the way you work as a club. As a club, you've got a way of doing things. And at times you, you might be the opposition coach, you might be in a different session and go, I wouldn't do it that way. That's not how we do it. So it's about checking that right from the start for me and supporting people in that process. Sometimes we have young coaches and actually it's their first time they've ever done something. So actually it's really important that we can shape them and support. And it talks about dealing with, um, things appropriately so do we respond in the right way do we report in the right way and do we react in the right way how do we go about making sure that we're there to support people when things go wrong the biggest you know the biggest takeaway for me is that um it's it's a wednesday night and there's 93 people on the call from some effect which is absolutely fantastic around this and actually it's about creating that safe environment and in whatever your role is within cricket, you have a you you play a part. And actually, if it is supporting your club safeguard officer, if it is you being the club safeguard officer, if it's you delivering sessions for young people that they enjoy, everyone's got that responsibility. And actually, it's a young person's responsibility as well because they're sometimes the best source of of information and, and, and what's going on. Uh, Matt, I think that's me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just pass to Brian, who's going to go through the next couple of slides. Rich, just, you're not going to get away with that, is it? I've, there's a couple of questions. Uh, one is around do, which I've had personally, it's not been in the group chat. Uh, as a club with no junior section, does our safeguarding responsibilities change, especially regarding do we need a, a safeguarding officer? For me, your safeguarding responsibility doesn't change because you will have young people and children that come into your setting. You'll also have adults that are in your setting and it's about creating that environment for them to stay and play cricket. So actually we have young, we have um, we play open age cricket for under 12 upwards and I know we've got under 11s if they're specialist pathways and stuff, but under 12s upwards could be coming into your contact, your cricket club. And so it's about still doing it, doing the right things, because actually if we're saying, oh, we're just adults, we'll keep everyone out. Well, actually, you might have a young player that wants to come play for you, you know, and pick it up and go from there. Having that safeguard officer in place. And yeah, they might feel like I'll just get, get everything in place and I keep safeguarding on people's ears. And actually, when something happens, we deal with it. That's that's having things in place. And perfect. And just an, just another one. Uh, it's around reporting. Uh Whilst there's a duty report, if there is a problem, what would be the implications for a club? Um, I, might, I might just challenge that question, Matt, because I think we need to flip that to what are the implications for that child? That, that, that's the flip for me. So if we know that someone has spoken to us, we know someone shared a concern, 
the implications for that child could be you know everlasting and ever changing so actually it's that moral we do we do the right things because we don't want that ever to happen to a child i guess at times that we think about ourselves as a club but if we step back from it and go what's the impact of that young person if i don't report this they've asked me to do something and and they've shared with me and then i don't do anything well that child's just being told don't ever tell anyone and that's the wrong messages so it's is that duty to report yeah we've taken you know there's from a club's point of view, it's your it's your reputation, it's your young people, it's your volunteers, it, 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 it's your club's name. And actually, that that needs protecting. That's what you do. You protect, you know, as a committee, you make sure that the club is there tomorrow for me. That's your role. We make sure we keep our club running and, we, and it's there for the next generation or the next people that take it up. So actually, that, that implication is people might not want to play cricket at your cricket club. People might not want to be involved in that name within your cricket club. And actually, it brings you on the radar for all the wrong reasons. But like I said, I would flip that over a little bit and just challenge and say, if we don't think do things right, actually, it's the child that misses out here, not you know from a club point of view. Thanks, Matt. I thought I was going to get away. No, sorry, sorry, Rich, but I thought they were two just relevant questions. No, no, happy to. Happy to, mate. Thanks for that, Rich. Uh, we'll hear from you a little bit later, but uh, over... Brian hopefully will be unmuting and he's going to talk to you about a few more things uh, relating to safeguarding and training and you, you get relevant qualifications. Thank you, Matt, and thanks, Rich. Uh, evening, everybody. I just want to, to reiterate, reiterate what Rich said earlier and thank you for logging in tonight. We really do appreciate you giving up your time to join us this evening. For those of you that uh, haven't met me before, my name is Brian Hoyle. Uh, I'm one of the safeguarding leads at the Somerset Cricket Board. I also head up the Safe uh, Hands Management System, Club Mark Accreditation Process and our DBS management system as well. So hopefully I've got fingers in a few pies with safeguarding. I can sort of pass you on some really good information in this section around um, qualifications for safeguarding, your volunteers' qualifications, um, controlling and managing your volunteers um, with the clubs and skills matrix, and also switch on the safe hands management system process. So firstly, uh, leading on from Richard's uh, slide regarding the roles and, and the responsibilities, your club safeguarding officer, you, you need to hold the three qualifications that are on the screen. You need to have an, an ECB safe hands qualification. Previously, this would have been face to face. Now with the current restrictions, it's done in, in the form of a webinar. It's valid for 24 months. And we put a book now link on these presentation slides, which we'll, we'll send out to you. Uh, booking on this will get you access to a live webinar possibly with Rich, possibly with Ashley, or one of the other team at the Safeguarding at ECB, and you'll be able to undertake this webinar and gain your Safe Hands qualification. Now, this is for existing and new uh, Safeguarding uh, officers. So whether your, your, your qualification is expired or whether you, you need it as a new to the role, this is a webinar for you to book onto. Within 24 hours of booking on the webinar, the ECB will send you a link to access the online Safeguarding and Cricketers certification. This is a second safeguarding aspect to the qualifications that you need. This is part of your e-learning account where you access this. You'll be able to go through this at your own time, at your own pace. You could save it, go back to it. There'll be a small assessment at the end of it. And then once you've done that, you're qualified with both of those two qualifications. Finally, your ECB DBS check. At the moment, the DBS check process, this is done remotely. Um, I'm hoping that from the 12th of April, this will go back to face to face and I'll touch on that later. But for now, this is done remotely. So in the first instance, you need to email Matt or myself for all the details that we've asked for on the screen there. We'll then take you through the remote process. We'll initiate your application. We'll make sure that we sort of talk you through the process, send you some comms to tell you how to do it. We'll ask for your evidence. We'll set up a, a remote meeting. This might be by, by um, FaceTime, Zoom or by Teams. And we'll get you authorised. Generally, your certificates are through within a couple of weeks. It really is a good, painless process. And it's pretty quick and, and quite easy as well. So just touching back on the DBS, from the 12th of April, um, all club safeguarding officers that previously accessed the DBS system and could carry out these checks at their clubs, you should be granted re-access to the system and be able to pick these up again. If there's a new safeguarding officer at your club, you've got a DBS check and you'd like to do this role, that'd be fantastic. It'd make it so much easier for the volunteers at your club. Then please do contact me with your details and I can set up the application process for you. So those are the qualifications you require as a safeguarding officer. Matt, could you move on to the next screen for me? 
Fine, thanks very much. So you need to start thinking about the volunteers at your club and, and what they might need. Now, what we've put up here is what we think is a really, really good document, the Clubs and Skills and Qualifications te Template. What this does, it, it highlights all the roles at your club that are going to require a safeguarding qualification. So as you can see, we've put the roles down the left-hand side and then across the top are all the safeguarding qualifications that may apply within cricket. You can see that, uh, for example, if you're a qualified coach, you don't need a safe hands workshop, you don't need a safeguarding protecting children, but you do need a DBS, safeguarding your cricketers and a first aid qualification. If you're a junior age group manager, the qualification that you need working across your row is, is an ECB DBS check. Now, we think this is a really good first step in really getting together the volunteers that you have at your club, making sure you know who does what roles, making sure you know exactly what qualification they need, and then you can start working with those volunteers to actually get that qualification. Um, something I'm going to touch on later in one of the next slides is the Safe Hands Management System. Um, clubs that are currently engaged with the Safe Hands Management System, you'll be updating this information online through your club portal. Um, however, we would say if you're not involved in the Safe Hands Management, this is a great a great sort of template document to use so you can start managing that process, making sure you're on top of your volunteers' qualifications and making sure you know who covers off which role at your club and what they're doing with working with your junior players. It's a really good document. Um, Matt, could you move on? Thanks. So ha having looked at the volunteers that are working at your club uh, and what qualifications they need, generally you're going to be looking at how you can provide them with DBS and, and, and online safeguarding and cricketers qualifications. What we started off by is putting a link to a, uh, all the roles that require a DBS for people working at clubs within cricket. Really good document. We get that asked question, ask that question a lot. Sort of, does this person need a DBS? Should I detail these guys? And will, will I need to help this person get a DBS? So we thought we'd summarise and provide you with the link to the roles that do require a DBS. And it's also a good cross-reference for you when you start filling in your skills and qualifications template. Online Safeguarding Young Cricketers Certification. Um, this is valid for three years. Um, we've touched on that previously. It's the same qualification for club safeguarding officers. So your qualified coaches require this. If uh, your coaches have previously undertaken the Safeguarding Young Cricketers module, then all they need to do is log back into their e-learning account. There's a forgotten password facility with it, and they'll be able to access that module and straight away they'll be waiting for them to complete in their e-learning account. Now, if for, for any reason they haven't done the safeguarding young cricketers, then please ask them to contact us. We can then um, get you onto our first online course that's available. Um, you'll receive a link to access the course and, and they can complete it straight away through the online safeguarding young cricketers e-learning portal. So, so all good there. Finally, DBS checks. Again, we touched on DBS as how to do that. It's currently a remote process. Please ask your volunteers to email Matt or myself with that information. We will talk you through exactly how to do this. We'll explain the process. It's real plain, painless process. And I'm sure we can get the DBS checks done very quickly with your volunteers. Ask them to get in touch with us and we'll go from there. Um, I think I've whisked through quite a bit of information there regarding qualifications. Um, Matt, is this a good time just to just to have a look in the chat box? Is there anything we need to go over? Uh, I think most have been picked up. Uh, the only question which hasn't is around current safeguarding qualifications run out next year. Do I need to do an SYC before then? I previously did the face-to-face -face court when they were face-to-face. -face. Um, uh, I would say wait till it's, it's due to run out sort of three to four weeks before it's due to out. If you've done this online safeguarding and cricket before, then log into your e-learning account. The, the course will be waiting for you to complete in the My Courses section. There is a forgotten password and there's a help desk at the ECB if you can't access it. If you haven't done the online safeguarding, please wait until your, S, your, your current SBC sort of gets to within a month of running out. Email me at the uh, cricket board. We'll provide our, our, our contact details later and we can enroll you onto the online safeguarding and cricket module. Uh, and another one, and I'm sure you're going to uh, cover it. Can DBS requests be done centrally by a club welfare officer or by the individuals themselves? Sorry, just say that again, Matt. Uh, can DBS requests be done centrally by a club officer or by the individuals themselves? Um, either way is fine. We're happy to accept individuals' emails with the information that's on screen so we can initiate the online check. 
Um, we also don't mind if club safeguarding officers are really on top of the safeguarding at their club. If they've got a list of, of, of candidates that require a DBS or existing uh, volunteers whose DBS is running out, if you want to send us the information that's detailed on screen, we'll take, a, we'll take it up from there. We'll initiate the online DBS applications and we'll be getting in touch directly with, with your volunteers to, to sort of go through the process and, and get things moving with them. Yeah, cheers, Brian. I think also one of the things is moving forward from the from the twelfth of April, provide, providing the government uh, guidance and roadmap goes on. Uh, face to face DBS will be uh, returning. Uh, so if your club welfare office is set up to do DBS by, uh, verifications, then they will be able to do it from the twelfth of April, providing the government roadmap goes to plan and that will be wide more widely communicated later this week as that was fairly hot off the press uh yeah. there's a yeah, couple just, of people one of the things for me to clear up as well is i think it's important we say how long these qualifications are valid for your dbs checks valid for three years your online safeguarding and cricketers is valid for three years and uh, the safe hands webinar qualification is valid for 24 months um, so just be clear on those. The final thing I'd like to touch on regarding the qualifications is the first aid qualification. Um, these are currently available through our Sunset Cricket Board schedule courses um, on our website and we'll provide you a link for these. We've got two courses that are available to book onto towards the end of April. We're hoping to, that these can run. We're also looking at schedule further, further courses in May and June to make first aid accessible. Unfortunately, at the moment, first aid courses ha are, have to be done face to face. Uh, the ECB don't recognise online first aid qualifications. And the final thing I think I need to say on it is that qualifications which expired since the 1st of March 2020, so in effect from when the lockdown period started, these will now remain valid until the 30th of September 2021. So because you haven't been able to undertake a first aid course, the ECB have extended the the uh, validation period of your course until 30th of September 2021 if your qualification expired since the 1st of March 2020. So quite a good move there. Perfect. Cheers, Bry. Uh, so there's a couple of other questions gone on. Is there any... So both, both I think, will be the for you, Rich, to be fair. Bry, you might dodge this one. Uh, so... Can you explain the difference between safeguarding officer and welfare officer and the courses needed? That's the first one. Okay, so simply, the it is just a name change. So there's no difference to the qualification. It's not an additional person. We're just changing the name of welfare officer to safeguarding officer because it better reflects the role. So within all, so the documentation spoke around earlier, working together, other other sports across areas. We talk about safeguarding. You're on a safeguarding. The, uh, you know event this evening so it's just bringing the name into line with other organizations statutory guidance just to make it more consistently we work as a safeguarding team so why would we have welfare officers we would have safeguarding officers and the courses are, are the courses that i think brian took us through earlier so that that earlier slide that brian spoke around around the webinar at the moment the syc and um, that was right wasn't it brian yep Fantastic. Matt, was there another one? And the, and the other one, uh, and I, I know the answer to this, but it will. But I think it's better coming from you because you know what's coming in the future. Is there any plans to make captains do SYC or safeguarding training? So plan, what, what, we, what we'll talk about is mandatory requirements and what we talk about is uh, best practice. So from a mandatory requirement, I'm not aware, and I use the word I'm not aware because there might be things that are happening that I am not aware of, um, that it will be mandatory that we will mark captains to do SYC. The course we're working on at the moment is something called a safeguarding, a cricket safeguard induction, because we're aware that we have a lot of people in cricket that don't have any safeguarding training. So you've got treasurers, you've got, you might have committee members, you might have parents, or well, you've got parents, I would have thought, that are, are coming in your cricket clubs. So we're creating an online module, which is about 45 minutes, which is like the basic level one introduction to safeguarding that we're hoping to be available in the next two to three months. And that's where we would say, we would encourage anyone that's involved in cricket to do that 
because actually it will give them the basic understanding of what they need to do. So from a mandatory requirement that will we stop the captain playing if they haven't got SYC? No, but what we do want is we need to ensure that we give them training and support and that's the offer that, you know, be very much a soft landing. Please encourage people across your cricket club, across all the parents, any members that come into contact, then that online so it takes it could take you about 40, 40 minutes online and then and go from there. Cheers, Matt. Perfect. Cheers, Rich. Uh, Brian, I'm going to let you continue because we've uh, we've answered quite a few questions there. Yeah, excellent. Well done. Uh, Matt, could you uh, just move on to the next slide? Thanks. Uh, I just want to talk very briefly around the safe hands management system. Uh, just sort of for, for those of you that are actively engaging with it, for those who have never heard of this before or might have heard of it and think what it's all about. It's a new system that's been developed and introduced by the ECB safeguarding team. We're, we're really positive here in Somerset about this. We were asked to trial and pilot this system. We think so far it's been a great success in our county and it, and it allows clubs to proactively manage their safeguarding compliance with the legal requirements of members in key roles and their qualifications and their safeguarding. So it, it's a tool for clubs to use to, to actively manage their safeguarding procedures, their volunteers, their qualifications, and, and to proactively sort of make sure that they're on top of safeguarding at their club. It does require some work up front to get everything online, but, but once you've done this, it, it involves loading volunteers, it involves um, allocating roles, it involves making sure they accept those roles. But once all this work's done, and that's where this having an up-to-date skills and qualifications template will be a real asset to clubs, it really does make managing compliance easier and more efficient. And this really does give peace of mind for club officials, and it gives you accurate and up-to-date information. The system's a, a live system. You're not sort of filling in a spreadsheet or a document, putting it to one side and picking it up six months later and thinking, Oh, I better update that or what's happening there? Are they, are, are they still DBS checked? This system is a live system that you can log into sort of very frequently and it will tell you who, who's at what position and what qualifications they've got. Currently, this is available to our club market accredited clubs. So we've got 42 clubs in Somerset engaging with this system. Um, we All of them are, are, are working actively towards full compliance, having all their volunteers DBS checked, all their safeguarding policies and, and volunteers in place for the start of the season. I think we've got six clubs, five to six clubs that are already fully compliant and, and sort of speaking regularly with these clubs and helping them through the process and really getting a good feel about how this is providing a real benefit to clubs in managing their safeguarding procedures, managing their volunteers and their qualifications. And actually once that upfront work's done, it's actually taking a huge chunk of work away from the people, the safe, safeguarding officers, secretaries, committee members who actually work actively on safeguarding in that club. A real good system. And Matt, if you could just go forward to the next slide for me. What I've done, is just to give you a feel for it, how it's going to look, give you a heads up, let you know what's coming. Uh, this is how sort of the, the club portal will look. You can see that kind of cricket club are detailed on there. All, all the people here are ECB volunteers, so nothing to worry about. But you can see you get the chance to put all your club details in on the left-hand side. Moving over into the right-hand side, you get to put your teams and programmes in, your number of players, your number of teams that you run, adult, juniors, the programmes that you run from the ECB. And then the really good section for you is the club official section. As you can see, all your volunteers will be listed. Um, the role that they do that you'll add in will be listed. It'll tell you their status of whether they, they're fully compliant. They've got all their safeguarding checks in. If they haven't, why not? Um, it'll also tell you their DBS status. Are they DBS checked? and also the, the expiry date of their DBS. Now, having this information on the live system, I think it's tremendous and really does let you proactively manage the safeguarding policies and volunteers moving forward. So we just wanted to make you aware of, of, of what's going to be coming out to you, what you can actually use, how we can support you with this. And um, I, I really just wanted you all to see the system and what it looks like because we think it's a really good system. So that was all. I just wanted that information to be passed on. Rich, um, I don't know whether you want to now just touch on perhaps a bit of a further rollout about the Safe Hands Management System and, and, and pick up any questions that come forward from it. So, so thank you, everybody. Thanks, Brian. And, and thanks for sharing the, the real positivity around Safe Hands Management System. It, it, for us, it's a tool for clubs. If we're putting an extra layer in, then we're going to prevent people from doing what they really want to do, which is volunteer and support their cricket clubs. So it is about giving... It is about giving you the tools to be able to do the role. 
So what, you know, Ryan's spoken about how you can see all your officials and all your information. What I will say is that this is kind of a bit like an evolving beast. We are at an early version to this. We want to add additional things on and that's where we're engaging with clubs, engaging with counties to add those next layer of things that you want on the system. So it's not about us sitting there going, this is what we'll give you, off it goes. Actually, it's a two-way conversation of how do we make this? If this isn't working, we need to know because then we can change it. We're at that point where we speak to the developers every day and we can change things within the system. It's really important for those that are using it that we use the correct email addresses for people, the full names, sound, sound like a broken record probably for Brian at the moment, full names. Um, and, and, and when you get your individual invite, that's your invite. It's not about sharing that with anyone else. That's your individual invite. From a rollout moving forward, our vision for, for the network is that every club will be on this system at, at some point. That's where we want to get to. We'll, whether we get there, to, we're not going to get there tomorrow, but we are going to go through a process. We're putting club mark, clubs on to get start with. Then we're going to move on to clubs with a junior section. And then we're going to get to clubs with just, just an adult, adult teams. So our vision, long-term vision is get as many people on the system as possible. And we will go as fast as the clubs and the counties can work it and the system can work it because it's got a, a support desk that deal with all those in, all those little inquiries that come in who'll be able to complete it so that's the safe hands management system um, can i go on to the next slide please Matt? so um once again this does reiterate something we are saying in the webinars at the moment but i think it's i think it's so important that we just take that moment to represent kind of what we've gone through we you know uh, myself at the ecb and the staff we hit our anniversary today so we're, we're absolutely one year from working from home today is the date since we were told don't come in that's it and and it's and it's been really weird it, it you know i travel my role i cover from cornwall to cumbria i'm here there and everywhere and now i've been tied to this desk for 12 months and it's been really difficult for me as an individual i represent that and i enjoy being around people and engaged and if i'm saying it's difficult for me as an adult my god it's been difficult for young people and children so what we're trying to say to you is as as cricket clubs and as individuals and volunteers within cricket when we get to play because i'm sure we're going to get to play Let's just remember that it has been difficult for them. There's been situations where they've not been playing cricket in the in the school in the schoolyard. Why? Because they're only allowed to do it in certain groups. They, and so it is so difficult for them at the moment. So for me, it's just about making it fun and as engaging as possible. Let's just get back to giving them what they want and really enjoying it and meeting those those needs that our young people have. I will mention that when we look at studies. Um, across COVID, there has been an increase concerns around young people, uh, uh, safeguarding concerns around young people. So we need to be aware of that. That's why we need to check in with our parents, check in with our volunteers and coaches, and check in with those young people, and really just make, like I say, make that ethos of let's just enjoy this game because we all do enjoy it. That's why we're here. That's why we've given up our Wednesday nights because we enjoy it and we want to give something back. So actually, it is about just making it that and being aware that it's been really difficult for them as well and we didn't want to deliver this tonight and not really give that message for you to go off and and work with your club and say do you know what actually i don't know if you like me but i'm really looking forward to leaving the house going out even just having the option of doing it is going to be great and young people are going to be in exactly the same way they're just going to want to go and enjoy their sport um matt i think i'm passing back over to you Yes, you are, Rich. Thank, thanks very much. Uh, we are pretty much at the end. So we, we wanted just to give you a bit of a, a takeaway of where you can get support. One thing that I, probably, I didn't say at the start, unfortunately, that obviously we have recorded it, so we will share the recording so you can listen back. All the slides will be shared. There's lots of hyperlinks in it so you can access a lot of this information again. Uh, but there are also some things uh, like the skills matrix, so we will share that template with you. Uh, and a few other relevant bits uh, where you can access information uh, in the main body of the email, which uh, should come out tomorrow, all being well. Uh, so locally in Somerset, uh, we've listed the safeguarding contact. So Ray Hancock is currently the safeguarding officer at the county. Uh, Ray will be shortly stepping down from the role uh, and we're currently just finalising a new uh, safeguarding structure within the county, and that will be publicised very shortly. 
Uh, so if you do need any support with anything, uh, the best people to contact at the moment uh, are Brian, uh, Amanda, uh, myself uh, and Andy. So if you do have any concerns about safeguarding or want any advice, please contact us. That's locally. And then we've got the ECB safeguarding team, which Rich is obviously a part of it. They're an additional uh, point of contact. They're here for advice and support. Uh, Rich is our is our county support person, and he's brilliant. Uh, anytime I get a, mi- a, a minor hiccup, and I'm not quite sure about it, he's great to check in with. Uh, so if I don't know the answer, or any of our team don't, we know people who do uh, can get back to you really quickly. Uh, Rich spoke about it earlier, about the safeguarding resources online. There are absolutely loads of resources there, uh, loads of different templates. Uh, so really take a look at them. Uh, you can pull them off. It's got a advising guide. It's some, got some good stuff on there. Uh, they can be contacted directly, uh, safeguarding ECB, uh, dbs at ecb.co.uk, and then there's the phone number on there. One thing that is not on here is and we will put it in the call, uh, just some other agencies uh, which are available uh, for safeguarding support, uh, both uh, uh, in, and including adults as well. Uh, so just wanted to make you aware of that. Uh, we're now just on the last slide about any questions. I don't know if any more have uh, come in at the moment. Uh one, really the safe hands management system. Is there any idea of the time for the next chance, i.e. though was with junior sections? I think Rich pretty much covered that at the moment, uh, but uh, I'll see if he's got a time. And then Rich, you've answered one about uh, duplication of, of roles. Yeah, so the only definites we've got are around club mark clubs at the moment. Our, you know, Our intention is to try and get those junior section clubs on by the end of the year if we can. Um, but we're very mindful that we need to we need to fit that in across the network. If, you know, the only thing that is is definite is club mark clubs will all be on the system by um, you in Somerset. You're all already on there, but nationally it'll be by um, halfway through April, and then after that, that's where we know that we're going to have a lot of engagement. And and we're also quite reflective to say that when we do get to play, people are going to want to play. So we're always shouting at you to go. Can you do this and can you do that? Actually you're going to be focusing on on making the game happen. So it's about us fitting in with what Somerset want to do from, from their staffing point of view and their support and also expectations on clubs. Because the last thing we want to do is when the whole situation is not have that understanding that actually we just want to go off and play some, play some cricket now, Rich. Let, let us go with such. Thanks, Matt. Perfect. Uh, so that does bring us to the end. Uh, Firstly, thank you for all your engagement and your brilliant answers earlier on. Uh, as I said, the, these will be shared hopefully tomorrow. Uh, we hope you've got got a lot out of it. Uh, I know for some of you, this will be a good refresher. Some of you, you would have picked up some uh, new information. Uh, but hopefully you, you fully understand a, a lot more about safeguarding. If you've got any questions or anything which you go away from tonight and go, oh, I wish I answered that drop it in an email uh, and we'll get you the answer and we'll we'll help support you through it Uh, but thank you very much for your your time this evening uh we're we're not too far away from cricket returning like we all want it to uh and hopefully that the covid situation keeps uh behaving and we keep going in the right direction so we can enjoy a lot more cricket than we did last uh summer but thank you all for your time and uh i will speak to you all soon thanks everyone thanks all